She reigned over a rapidly changing country in the last days of a once vast empire. And through it all, many people say that the queen ruled with a steady hand and quite a devotion to the British people, always talking about her service to the nation. And her oldest son, Prince Charles, succeeds her now as Britain's new king. Mark Phillips now has the queen's extraordinary life story. She was not born to be queen, but she became so much more than the ceremonial head of state of a mid-sized European country. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor, Queen Elizabeth II, reinvented the British monarchy and may have saved it. Elizabeth was already 10 years old when another royal drama led to her becoming heir to the throne. In 1936, her uncle, Edward VIII, abdicated to marry the American divorcee Wallace Simpson, and the royal line shifted to her father, George VI, and so to her. The young Princess Elizabeth was already a public favorite. During the Second World War, she had worked to raise the country's morale, and she had also served as a volunteer in the war effort. I am sure that you are often thinking of the old country to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. Her marriage to Philip Mountbatten, an anglicized member of the deposed Greek royal family, gave a war-weary country something to celebrate. And the children the marriage produced, first Charles and then Anne, secured the future. Elizabeth's coronation in 1953 was the first ever to be televised. Its combination of ancient ceremony and glittering glamour cemented her as the personification of Britain's post-war rebirth. And it began a reign with a singular purpose. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. Elizabeth's reign would be the longest ever in a royal bloodline that goes back over a thousand years. But the royal ride was sometimes bumpy. The stability and continuity the monarchy was supposed to provide began to look shaky as one by one the royal marriages broke down around her, her sister Margaret's, her daughter Anne's, her son Andrew's. They all ended in awkward divorces. None was uglier than the breakup of Prince Charles and Diana Spencer. The long public unraveling of the marriage of the heir to the throne seemed to shake the very foundations of the royal household. When, in the early 1990s, Windsor Castle also went up in flames, the Queen's famous stoicism was tested. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. However horrible the year, the Windsor Castle fire and the public complaints over the skyrocketing repair costs produced a turning point in royal history. Monarchs normally collect taxes, but from then on, the Queen agreed to pay taxes on her income. Royal behavior was also changed by the shocking death of Diana in that Paris car crash. The national outpouring of grief seemed to highlight the emotional gap between the queen and her people. Elizabeth did much to repair the damage with a single bow of the head to the passing coffin of a popular princess. No one who knew Diana will ever forget her. Millions of others who never met her but felt they knew her remember her. There would be other challenges, one of the most serious centering around the wife of one of Diana's sons. When Prince Harry's biracial American wife, Meghan Markle, complained of mistreatment by palace officials, the couple renounced the royal life and moved to California. When Elizabeth's husband, Prince Philip, who she had described as her strength, died, she was left alone to face the last chapter of her reign. Over seven decades on the throne, Elizabeth redefined the monarchy, remade it for a more modern, less deferential age. And in the process, she became not just Queen of Great Britain, she became, in a way, Queen of the World.
Mark Phillips, CBS News, London. And a remarkable life and legacy we want to show you now. Live pictures from Buckingham Palace where they have just posted the notice of Her Majesty's passing. Out front where their crowds have gathered there. Holly Williams is there outside Buckingham Palace and Holly, there have been signs that her health was failing in recent days. That's correct, Nora. I mean, she's been in, in poor health for months now, experiencing mobility issues. Um, we've frequently seen her using a, a walking stick. She's missed some very important events because of her health, including some of the events uh, at her Platinum Jubilee, uh, which was celebrated this past summer. And then this week, uh, the UK has a new Prime Minister. The new Prime Minister has to meet the Queen. Typically, that happens here in London at Buckingham Palace, but uh, it was unprecedented this time. The new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, travelled around 500 miles to Scotland to meet the Queen. And those, I, I believe, uh, the final images um, that we have of the Queen appearing uh, in public, uh, looking very elderly uh, and, and very frail. I think it's impossible to overstate the extent to which this is the end of an era. Um, she was a, a tiny woman in physical stature, but she was a giant, a towering figure in this country. She ascended the throne when she was a fresh-faced young mother. Uh, she is leaving it a, a great-grandmother. When she ascended the throne, Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister in this country, uh, and British people were enduring austerity uh, following World War II. It is now uh, a modern, multicultural society. I think uh, Queen Elizabeth II's trademarks are known not just here in this country, but around the world. She was known for her big hats, uh, for, her, for her love of bright colours, uh, for her love of sensible shoes, and for her beloved corgi dog. She was always uh, seemingly surrounded by a swarm of them. I think we can expect a, a period uh, of several days of national mourning uh, in this country. Her successor, as you mentioned, is Charles, her eldest son. Um, as I said, this really is the end of an era. And to give you an indication of that, for more than 70 years, the national anthem of this country has been God Save the Queen. It will now become God Save the King. Wow, Holly Morrill, Holly Williams, thank you. Yes, and um, the Queen was born April 21st, 1926. That year was also the first public demonstration of a true TV just to give you a sense. And as you mentioned, of course, that la those last pictures that we saw of Her Majesty at Balmoral was when she was welcoming the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Um, she has reigned and uh, worked with 15 prime ministers during her time, and uh, the first being Winston Churchill. Um, we're going to be talking about her legacy, her life, um, for a while now this afternoon and for the next many days of mourning. And Holly, I just must ask you, since you're there, tell us about the mood, the people that have gathered. Yeah, it's very interesting, Nora. So the, the, the news that she was in quite poor health uh, and the atmospherics were not good came at around noon local time. Uh, and we began to see people gather here outside the gates of Buckingham Palace. We're trying to give you a, a shot of that now. Several hundred people at least. Um, uh, this, is not, this is not normal. These people are gathering because of the news. And let's see what happens in the hours to come if we see a, a, a larger outpouring of grief uh, for this uh, much loved monarch. Um, let me tell you about what we think will happen in the days to come. We understand uh, that Queen Elizabeth's remains will come here to Buckingham Palace, uh, her London home. We understand that uh, she will lie in state at Westminster Palace, just down the road from here. That is the home of, of the British Parliament. Um, we understand that her funeral will be held at Westminster Abbey, also very close to where, where we're standing right now. And we understand that she will finally be laid to rest at Windsor Castle, which is just outside of London. If you cast your mind back, you'll remember that's where her husband, Prince Philip, uh, was buried last year. Holly Williams there outside Buckingham Palace, stand by. We want to bring in CBS News royal contributor and author of the Diana Chronicles, Tina Brown. Tina, good to see you. I mean, there's so much to talk about. First, your reaction. It is a moment of, of such epic sorrow. 
we've all had our you know breath baited for the last year about the queen's health as the successive bulletins and the moments of intake of breath when she went for tests last october when she got covid in in february when you felt that the jubilee was you know we were in uh, waiting to know whether she'd be able to do those things and she did twice manage to appear which was an extraordinary effort obviously on her part so this is the moment everybody has dreaded and it's a it's a heartbreaking uh, uh thing to have lost this extraordinary personification of duty patriotism decency human decency that the queen has represented for so long and her service to the nation which has been absolutely unfailing from the moment she took that vow that oath uh, uh, when she became queen at the age of 25 such a young girl she said I am willing when she was asked uh, will you take this oath of office and she has been ever willing ever there her reassurance as a figure is going to be so deeply lost at a time um, when the world is in such revolutionary, you know, shaking of, of the national uh, a sense of stability. She was the still point. She was the person that people looked up to. They knew where she would be at any moment of the year, the same routine, all of her life, you know, all of her reign, Sandringham and Balmoral and Windsor Castle. We knew where she was at any point. And she reassured the nation on so many occasions, you know, from whether it was the, the as, a, as a young girl during World War II, uh, during the Gulf War, during COVID, during the death, of course, of Diana, when she had to calm the crowds and speak to the nation, as, a, as she put it, as a, both a, a queen and a grandmother. The queen has been the most reassuring figure in all of our lives. I mean, 70 years on the throne, we two generations, three generations know nothing but her. So this is going to be an enormous identity crisis for the feeling that we've lost the person who, in a sense, represented the very best of British values and is no more. Tina, she had four children, eight grandchildren, 12 great-grandchildren, a mother and grandmother. How did she view her role as queen? Well, she was always able to uh, separate her roles. That's what she was so brilliant at. I mean, she was the constitutional monarch who was always impartial after 70 years on the throne. We do not know to this day what the queen thought about anything. She never spoke about her political opinion. She never revealed what she was thinking. She mastered the art of the sort of, you know, the unreadable face. We never knew what the queen was thinking. and in public at any rate but off duty she was a very uh, humorous uh, amusing tart uh, witted figure who loved uh, you know to be made to laugh um, and who also at the same time understood that her role was two very different things when she was the children always knew the grandchildren always knew that when they were going to see the queen as mother as grandmother she was her amazing off-duty self if you went to see her about anything that was related to their official roles or their, you know, the constitutional aspects, you were going to meet the CEO of the monarchy. You were going to meet the Queen Chairman of the Board. You were going to meet the Queen with her private secretaries who were around a table. She had two very different identities, essentially, and she managed to keep those two roles separate, really. Sometimes they collided when the children's issues really kind of seeped into the wider aspects. But uh, she really, for, for 70 years, she was the most remarkable executive of the crown, if you like. With poise and grace, Tina mm -hmm. Brown, thank you. Let's turn now to Mark Phillips, who's covered the royal family for many years. Good to see you, Mark. And as you pointed out in your beautiful piece that we showed, sort of looking back over her life, she was not supposed to be queen. Uh, no, she wasn't. It was uh, an accident of history, another dramatic twist uh, in the royal family's history, of course, uh, the abdication leading to her father becoming uh, king and then uh, and her following. But you know, as Tina was saying as well, that this was a day we all knew was coming. Uh, we had all prepared for it. There are procedures and protocols in place, and yet when it happens, it's still somehow a shock, uh, probably because nobody can imagine a time when, when she wasn't uh, queen. Uh, this 96-year-old woman, seven decades on the throne, all of the stories, the long sagas involving her children, uh, the marriages that came and went, uh, all of the trouble uh, and all of the grief lately on the sad passing of her, her husband less than two years ago. 
And watching this very sad decline uh, over the past several years that was put down to the, what the palace kept calling mobility issues, transient mobility issues. We knew she couldn't get around much, but clearly there was something much more seriously wrong with her as well that everybody suspected, but of course uh, wasn't talked uh, about. Um, but the, uh, the, the constitutional clock ticks on here. Uh, immediately upon the Queen's passing, her son Charles became Queen. The Queen is dead, long live the King. And one of the wishes that she had uh, conveyed uh, within the last couple of years ago, uh, involving Charles's wife uh, Camilla, immediately uh, was given uh, support as well with the palace announcement that the king and the queen consort meaning camilla uh, would be traveling down to london so the business of state uh, goes on she carried on as you would expect of her uh, right till the very end performing those bu that business of state uh, swearing in accepting the resignation of an outgoing prime minister two days ago and uh, and commissioning a new one to, to form a government uh, pictures of her standing and doing it looking frail but doing her job she she literally died with her crown on mark phillips Thank you. We want to show you a live picture of 10 Downing Street, uh, the prime minister's residence and office. And um, he, we are expecting, uh, they've just placed a podium, you can see, out in front. And we are expecting to hear from the new prime minister, Liz Truss, shortly, who was one of the last people to see the queen in person just two days ago. Let's bring in CBS News royal contributor and British historian Amanda Foreman. And Amanda, as we await uh, the prime minister's remarks, I do want to talk to you about the queen's place in history and her legacy. How do you see it? Well, the, the queen's place in history begins with her being the head of the Commonwealth and how she helped to steer uh, Great Britain's new role in the world after World War II. Uh, the Commonwealth is still doing very well. She's still the head of state of 14 countries. There's still over 50 countries part of the Commonwealth. And she saw that very much uh, as, as part of her most important duty. When she was 21, she gave a speech in which she said, the motto of my ancestors is I serve. And that, that was the, the guiding motto for her entire life. So that's her first legacy. The second, actually, is a legacy of feminism. Now, she herself would never have used that word. Nevertheless, as, as a woman who carried on working, who aged until the age of 96, but showed that she was always relevant, uh, she is the original woman who nevertheless persisted. So these two things, how to be a woman, how to be a woman in charge, how to be uh, the CEO of the firm, as the royal family was often called in, in, in jest, uh, set an example for women around the world. And it was one of the reasons why she was so beloved. She also utilized the, the power of soft power incredibly well. And her legacy uh, for future leaders, as well as the royal family, is how she was able to use her influence in a way that never seemed to be actually using her influence. That was extremely important. The relationship between the US and the UK has never been better. And that is very much part of her legacy. She visited America over four times. And each of those royal visits were a roaring success. If you look at, uh, for example, her visit in 1976 to celebrate the bicentennial, she danced with President Ford at the White House. And there was so much jollity at the occasion that when she went onto the dance floor, the band played The Lady is a Tramp. And uh, that was seen as, as a, a, a mark of affection for her, the, the queen who could uh, do such um, amazing things with grace and also humor. So her relationship with the U.S., with, with Americans, has been one of, the, the, one of her greatest legacies that she, she leaves, a relationship that is in robust health between the two countries. And her relationship with the Obama, was, with the Obama family was in particular, in particular very, um, very warm. Uh, there were three visits between them, and uh, each time you could see that the warmth uh, between the two w was growing. And so it's an extraordinary thing that a woman who was able to transcend so many generations and carry such 
the, the age of wisdom and experience with her was nevertheless able herself to keep on modernizing and changing uh, as the times went on in the it's 1980s. A it's a wonderful point, Amanda, that you make and, um, you know, the length of her reign. She was alive for 14 American presidents, but met 13. She did not meet Lyndon Johnson because she was pregnant uh, at the time. But, you know, for many Americans who are not students of British history, many of them do have subscriptions to Netflix and <laughs> watch The Crown for sure. And so they do know um, that Queen Elizabeth was the first royal to utilize the power of television. And in fact, you know, her coronation uh, in 1953 was seen by almost half the UK population. It was rebroadcast to millions more around the world, making the point that you have that she was a global figure for decades. Um, in 1957, the Queen marked another milestone, broadcasting the first Christmas Day speech on television. So we want to show you some of that because in that historic address, the Queen reinforced her pledge which was this pledge that Tina was talking about, this life of public service, to live a life devoted to the people. I cannot lead you into battle. I do not give you laws or administer justice. But I can do something else. I can give you my heart and my devotion to these old islands and to all the peoples of our brotherhood of nations. Let's bring back in Tina Brown because that very point about her modernizing and living with the times and learning to adapt to television and all of the other things so that she could continue um, to not only represent the monarchy, but hopefully she tried to transition it into a modern age. She really did, and people often think of the monarchy as this sort of static organization. But what was so brilliant about the Queen was that she was always able to move that glacier but do it with enormous uh, judiciousness, um, shrewdness, and appropriateness each time. I mean, her reign begins, if you think about it, with her having to tell her sister, Princess Margaret, that she cannot marry the man she loves because he was a divorced man, he was an older man, and that was a terrible blow that had to be delivered to her sister. But then you see how things have moved so that now, uh, you know, so Charles was allowed eventually uh, to marry the woman that he loved, even though she was a divorced woman. Uh, you see the way she joyfully accepted um, a woman of mixed race joining the family in, in Meghan Markle. Um, and you see also how William and Kate were allowed to live together, you know, before they married, which before would have been absolutely unthinkable. But the Queen understood that it couldn't again happen that, uh, you know, that a young prince like William would not be able to really be sure about the woman who loved because we'd seen the disaster of what happened with Diana. So you see her moving these things inside the family into the kind of the mood of the country and she's so well judged about these things. And then of course with the soft power aspect, as Amanda was, was saying, I mean, her, her visit to Ireland in 2012, which was the first time, uh, you know, since, uh, uh, you know, the troubles was really an extraordinary um, act of, of uh, reconciliation, in a sense, that, that, that made that, that sort of uni you know, feeling between Britain and Ireland change so tremendously and was considered, I think, one of her great political successes, although she wouldn't use the word political, but it actually was, but soft power. You know, uh, in, in reading about her life and researching it, you know, she was born Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor, we mentioned in 1926, but her full ruling name is Elizabeth II by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and of her other realms and territories, Queen, head of the Commonwealth, defender of the faith. I think for some they forget still how vast the Commonwealth is, and still um, the moves for independence by Scotland and Northern Ireland. Tina? Well, in, uh, the irony, of course, is that the Queen has reigned over an ever-shrinking um, dominion. Um, but her grace and her, her understanding and her sort of cultural sophistication, if you like, has made her understand that her most important role was to see the end of all that colonial uh, feeling and allow each of these countries to uh, emerge into independence, which they have, many of them, not all of them, um, and 
it's been a, one of really her most remarkable feats has been to be essentially um, helped to make turn the Commonwealth into this family of nations uh, that that is there voluntarily. That is a, a club of nations that wants to be a part of it, and that is off, that has really been because of her presence, because of the respect that the Queen has had, that uh, these nations have wanted to still be a part of that club. Tina Brown, thank you. It is two o'clock in the East here, and we are on the air with the breaking news that Queen Elizabeth II, the longest serving British monarch, died today at Balmoral Castle, her summer home in Scotland. Her Majesty was 96 years old. She had spent a record 70 years on the throne. We had learned early this morning that Buckingham Palace had announced that she was under medical supervision. She had canceled a meeting last night. We watched uh, members of her family, her children, take a private plane to Scotland to be there with her by her side. Uh, they are still inside. Those are live pictures of the gate there outside Balmoral Castle, this summer home. Um, that she has spent so much time at during her reign. And then, of course, the royal website uh, announcing the news um, just about a half an hour ago in which they noted that she died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. And in that statement, it said, the king and the queen consort will remain there through this evening and will return to London tomorrow, already declaring that Prince Charles is now the King of England. And in London, this is how our partners at the BBC announced the death of the Queen just a short time ago. A few moments ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The palace has just issued uh, this statement. It says the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. And that return to London will mark many days of remembrance for uh, the Queen and then also what is expected to be a celebration of what they call the continuity of the monarchy and the coronation of the new king. Holly Williams is outside Buckingham Palace, and Holly, um, Prince Charles is now king. What comes next? That's correct, Nora. Well, we're not expecting his coronation uh, for several months to come. I think it's a colossal understatement to say that Queen Elizabeth II will be a very hard act to follow for her son. Uh, she had the kind of popularity that politicians can only dream of. Uh, some would argue that she was almost single-handedly responsible for shoring up support for the monarchy as an institution in this country, not because of what she said. Um, she was a woman of, of very few words. She didn't say very much, but because of what she did. You know, she was widely regarded as quiet, reliable, steadfast, and a true servant of her people. She was loved by many people in this country, but just as importantly, she was respected by many people who are not fervent monarchists. And, and there are many of those people in this country. Uh, Charles uh, and his wife Camilla are both uh, much less popular. Charles has uh, from time to time been criticised for seeming to take uh, political positions on various issues. He's already uh, well into his 70s. He's been waiting to take over this job essentially his whole life. But but let's see how, how he does. Let's see perhaps how he changes, how Camilla changes when they step into these new roles. They have already stepped into them as king and queen consort. Holly Williams, thank you. Let's bring back in Mark Phillips. And Mark, Tina talked about this. How did the queen use that so-called soft power? I think we can we can fairly say that she invented uh, the use of soft power here. Remember, this is uh, this was a woman who was, had been on the throne since the early 50s. We've already said she was had been through 15 uh, British prime ministers. Uh, her first U.S. president was Eisenhower. Her first British prime minister was Churchill. So imagine that this is you know, two of the megalithical political figures of our time were her first two 
heads of government uh, that she dealt with both here and with Britain's most important ally, and ally uh, in the U.S. And she then covered the period, this great post-war historical period. She was the one surviving personality in all of that. And as time went on, she became a more and more important personality, even though political decisions may have been uh, made elsewhere. There are people in the palace and who work in the Foreign Affairs uh, Service here who I've spoken to over the years who say that there, there is nobody in the world, be they leaders of uh, autocratic communist regimes or anywhere else in the world who does not want to come and see, did not want to come and see the Queen. It was always the biggest thing that had to happen. There had to be a session with the Queen. Uh, state visits for Chinese presidents uh, were given much more importance if the Chinese president could ride in the royal carriage on, the, on a ceremonial parade with the queen. That kind of thing had kind of untold influence here, particularly at a time when Britain's industrial power and political power in the world were clearly in decline in the post-war years. Uh, she became the poster child for Britain, and then, and then the poster mother, and then the poster grandmother, I suppose, and, and great-grandmother. Uh, and through much of that time, there were some downs, but most of them uh, being up, she remained deeply uh, entrenched in the hearts of the country. Uh, the support for the monarchy here generally, if you take polls, runs in the range of 70 to 80 uh, percent. Uh, where it goes now, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, as Holly was just alluding to as well. Uh, but the support for her has effectively been 100 percent. Nobody thinks that uh, anybody could have done a better job than she did, both for the country, for the country's image abroad, for the relationships that she struck with important people around the world. Mm. Stand by, Mark Phillips. We've just received now a statement from His Majesty the King at the time of the Queen's death. And he says, the death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms, and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. And then he goes on to talk about this period of mourning and change that now commences. And Mark, I just want to follow up and put a little bit of a finer point on what you were talking about, that soft power that she wielded, because in reading about her life, I was reminded, of course, that perhaps the only thing she loved more than her dogs were her horses. <laughs> and she is known for her equestrian diplomacy, as it was called. And there are old pictures of her riding horses with Ronald Reagan. And it said that she helped secure Washington's support for the Falklands War mm. in many of her meetings with Ronald Reagan. So that was, yeah. Oh, here's the Prime Minister. I apologize. I believe she's standby on that thought. And let's go now to the new Prime Minister. We are all Mistress. devastated by the news that we have just heard from Balmoral. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. She ascended the throne just after the Second World War. She championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. We are now a modern, thriving, dynamic nation. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. She was the very spirit of Great Britain, and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. Her, la her life of service stretched beyond most of our living memories. In return, she was loved and admired by the people in the United Kingdom and all around the world. She has been a personal inspiration to me and to many Britons. Her devotion to duty is an example to us all. Earlier this week, at 96, 
she remained determined to carry out her duties as she appointed me as her 15th Prime Minister. Throughout her life, she's visited more than 100 countries and she has touched the lives of millions around the world. In the difficult days ahead, we will come together with our friends across the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and the world to celebrate her extraordinary lifetime of service. It is a day of great loss, but Queen Elizabeth II leaves a great legacy. Today, the crown passes, as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty, King Charles III. With the King's family, we mourn the loss of his mother. And as we mourn, we must come together as a people to support him, to help him bear the awesome responsibility that he now carries for us all. We offer him our loyalty and devotion, just as his mother devoted so much to so many for so long. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. Well, a moving statement there from the Prime Minister about the passing of an era and um, saying that the UK is devastated by the death of the Queen, the rock on which the modern Britain was built. Let's bring in our Face the Nation moderator, Margaret Brennan. And um, Margaret, so much changes now in a time when the Prime Minister has a lot to deal with at home as well. She does indeed. And now the King will be uh, potentially someone to turn to for counsel, but nothing like what Queen Elizabeth had with 70 years on the throne. If you think about those 70 years, that's really the shaping of the world order that we know right now. And she witnessed it. So that counsel won't be there for Prime Minister Truss in that same way. Um, that soft power, perhaps not as much of a tool potentially for her at a time she needs it. I mean, take a look at what's happening in the United Kingdom right now. It is really on the verge of major economic crisis with uh, recession forecast, inflation at a 40-year high, worst inflation in Europe, an identity crisis underway that you gestured to earlier. Um, I mean, she was the, the queen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Meanwhile, there's still a nasty divorce with Europe going on, in particular around this issue of Northern Ireland. There's an independence movement in Scotland. So exactly what the kingdom will look like, the shape it will take, may be changing for the new monarch as he steps into that role. And it, it really is, um, I, I want to come back to something Tina Brown pointed out earlier in terms of the soft power. Mm -hmm. That 2011 visit that the Queen made to Ireland, the very first monarch since Irish independence, the Taoiseach, the leader of Ireland today, uh, releasing a statement giving her credit for helping to uh, establish ties between the two countries and helping to overcome that really painful colonial past. So that's not um, something to simply be dismissed. That That is a powerful symbol. As close as they could have come to apology, she called it sad and regrettable reality. Mm -hmm. um, so there is uh, some legacy there, though, we will see what happens uh, with the king now stepping into this role. Uh, President Biden has said um, in recent months, you know, how he enjoyed his conversations uh, with the queen, which you saw in June. Um, we're expecting the White House to, of course, say something now. Um, we'll be standing by for that. Yes, and expecting, of course, reaction that is already pouring in from around the world. Around the world, from across the realms and the Commonwealth. And that is so interesting, given Great Britain's sometimes very painful relationship to have the, the, the leaders of countries like Ireland and India coming out and expressing remorse. It speaks to who she was and the symbol of what she had become rather than the country and some of the more um, thorny political issues that the Queen had really helped some of these leaders navigate. Think about the Trump administration mm -hmm. and what it meant to President Trump. Uh, some of his advisors have talked about how that really took uh, some of the rough edges off that trip that, that he got to sit uh, with the Queen at that time uh, when U.S.-U.K. relations were somewhat frayed. Mm -hmm. um, so she has played a real role in helping to navigate. 
Margaret Brennan, thank you. I know you'll stand by with us. I want to return now to Holly Williams, who is outside Buckingham Palace and the sun setting there and the crowds gathering. And I understand there's been a beautiful double rainbow. There was a little earlier, Nora. Um, we began to see people actually gather outside uh, the, the golden gates of Buckingham Palace here earlier this afternoon when we just had the news that the Queen was obviously in quite poor health and that her family had, had rushed to be with her in Scotland. Hundreds of people began gathering. That's unusual at this time of year, at, at this time of the day. People are now pouring into the streets of this part of central London. I would say there are now uh, thousands of, of people gathered here. The Union Jack, uh, which flies atop of Buckingham Palace, was lowered immediately on that official news um, that the Queen had passed away. Now, you know, I think all of us probably can cast our minds, or many of us, if we're the right age, can cast our minds back to 1997 when Princess Diana died and the, the, the thousands of people that swarmed central London to, to pay their respects to her. That was, of course, a very different situation. She was a very young woman. Um, she, she died in, in very shocking and unexpected circumstances. This is a very elderly monarch. We've known that she's been uh, in, in poor health for months. This is not uh, totally unexpected, but she was much loved by many, many, many people in this country. So let's see, uh, let's see how this plays out here in central London in the hours uh, and days to come. We know that uh, British officials have been, have been planning for this moment uh, for many years. We understand uh, that it, the plans for the Queen's funeral even have a name uh, known as Operation London Bridge. Mm. Holly Williams, thank you. And I think as Mark Phillips also said today, and while the news is not a surprise, it still comes as a shock once you hear it. And of course, many had um, just recently remembered the passing um, of her husband. The Queen was married to Prince Philip for 73 years. They were the longest married couple in British royal history. And in 1997, for their 50th wedding anniversary, we want to play for you some of what Elizabeth, uh, the, Her Majesty, had to say about the importance of Philip to her, as well as to Britain. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. Mm. I want to bring back in Tina Brown, because Tina was just last year, I think he died just before reaching the age of 100. And I remember thinking at the time, they have been together for so long and had been together for so much that it's hard any time when someone loses a spouse that they've been with for, for their, almost their entire life. Yes, and what was so, in a way, touching and, and amazing was that the last year of Philip's life, they spent together more time than they've ever spent in their entire life because they were locked down together at Windsor Castle in their bubble. And it was almost like the sort of the beginning of their courtship when they had this kind of wonderful sort of intimate uh, last days together there. Uh, which was a great blessing, an unexpected blessing, really, for the both of them, essentially, particularly for the Queen. Uh, Philip kept the Queen real. That's why she loved him so. He had a strong sense of humour. He was incredibly irreverent. He made her laugh, and he always told her the truth. And that is what she loved about him. What was his relationship like with now King Charles III? A very complicated and very difficult relationship, unfortunately. Um, they sort of, they, kept, they were like ships that passed in the night. They could never properly connect. Uh, he, Charles was a disappointment to Philip. Uh, there's no question, and he made no secret of it. Uh, Charles was, you know, sensitive, uh, you know, aesthetic, uh, very, uh, you know, a, a person who needed a lot of mothering and didn't get it. And Prince Philip uh, and he never had a good relationship, really. I mean, they had moments late, latterly where they got on better. But when Philip died, all Charles's memories of him in the documentary they made were about times when he'd sort of disappointed his father. It was very touching in a way. So it was, it was a very difficult relationship. He, he was much closer, Philip, uh, in fact, to Edward, to Anne, uh, and even to Andrew. Hmm. 
complicated, as they say, or complicated, right. as they say, with, a, with an accent, you know, certainly. <laughs> and, and on that point, how do you expect King Charles to, to rule? Well, Charles has been groomed for this role for 50 years. I mean, he certainly understands what it means and what it takes. And he has a very statesmanlike knowledge at this point of world affairs and world leaders. I mean, he's met everybody over his life and he's been to multiple places and he's supported the Queen, particularly latterly, in a, in a very uh, uh, measured way, actually. But of course, he won't have the mystique that the Queen had because we know too much of what Charles thinks about everything. We know nothing about what the Queen thinks. But I do actually think that Charles, if, if ever there could be a time for him to take over, this is a good time. Uh, his passions uh, for the environment, very prescient, uh, which he believed long before others. Uh, his sense of, you know, his love of organic farming, his belief in, you know, his concern about climate change. His passions, his, his beliefs, um, really have kind of finally met the moment when other people agree with him after being seen as a bit of a kook and a crank for so long, which is completely wrong, but it's how British people viewed him. So it's a good time, if there is a good time, for him to take over this role. Uh, and his, his job will actually be, be to prepare things, prepare the path for William, because it's William's reign, essentially, that is going to be the, f the next stage of the, of the modern monarchy, not, not Charles's. Really interesting. Tina Brown, thank you. I want to bring back in Mark Phillips on that point because he is the oldest and longest serving heir apparent in British history. Um, Mark, as, as Tina was pointing out, someone who's been essentially preparing for this his entire life. Longest internship in history, I think, is the expression that's, uh, <laughs> that's sometimes used here. But this, this is very much a transitional moment, not just for the obvious reason that the Queen is now dead and that uh, Charles, who's a much different personality and is viewed much differently uh, both in the country uh, and outside, but for the whole uh, post-war idea of Britain, the whole post-war idea of this monarchy reaching across the globe and what have you. There's already been a movement afoot in several places, uh, in the Caribbean uh, most prominently, as a legacy to the slavery uh, issue and the role of, uh, of the British colonialism uh, in that sev several countries, Barbados, for example, has already removed the Queen as head of state. There are nascent uh, movements to, uh, to dump her, uh, well, now him, uh, the, royal, the British monarch, uh, elsewhere in the Car Caribbean and, and around the country as well. We're, this is very, it's very, very likely, I think, that this Queen, uh, for all of her accomplishments and all of her length of stay in office, will be seen as the high watermark uh, of the British monarchy in the post-war world. Yeah, an important point to make just about how her passing is more than just symbolic, um, as Mark is pointing out, and could change a great many things around uh, the world. I do want to note um, that Paul McCartney, who met Queen Elizabeth several times, um, spoke about her legacy to Gail King. Let's listen. What does it mean to you to be Sir Paul McCartney? You know what it's like? It's an honor. And you think of things like, weren't you mother and father, my mom and midwife, and my dad just a cotton salesman? How proud they would have been, you know. Even prouder to know the queen would make their son a companion of honor. So I was feeling pretty cheeky by now. I'm thinking, you know, I'm getting quite at home here. So I said to her, and she shook her hand, I said, we've got to stop meeting like this. And she went, what? What? <laughs> and let's bring in historian Amanda Foreman. And Amanda, on that point of her legacy and what she meant to so many people, this will affect uh, so many, and we will be mourning her life and essentially watching what is going to be several days of ceremony, correct? Yes, that is correct. Uh, there's going to be 10 days of official mourning. She will lie in state in Westminster Hall. Uh, people will be able to uh, visit there for 23 hours a day. Uh, her funeral is going to take place in Westminster Abbey. And that's going to be the first time uh, that a monarch's funeral will be in Westminster Abbey since 1760. So that is a momentous occasion in and of itself. And then she will 
uh, go to Windsor Castle where she will be buried in the chapel there alongside her husband. So the, these are the, 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 some of the events that we can expect to happen. And as a historian, look back for us. What, what will, in the scope of her legacy in the second Elizabethan era, how will that be remembered? How will it be written about in the books? The first thing that the history books are going to comment on are that uh, she was the longest reigning monarch in British history. And uh, because she reigned so long, like her predecessor, Elizabeth I and, and Queen Victoria, the two other extremely long reigning uh, queens, uh, she defined her age. And that meant that although Britain's place in the world did decline after the Second World War, she nevertheless helped to keep this small island nation very much in the public eye and to uh, give it a sense of glamour and importance that a country whose economy actually only puts it in the you know, top 10 of, of world economies may not have otherwise uh, merited. Her second important point, though, was that as, as a woman and as a queen, she helped to define how women were going to be in the modern age. Uh, she didn't um, have, an, as it were, a paying job, but she nevertheless had a job. And so people were able to look at her and think, this is how a woman who is important dresses, this is how she looks, she doesn't have to be a sex symbol or anything like that. And so that legacy is incredibly important. And then finally, her public service, her sense of duty, that is something that people can still uh, uh, latch onto in a world where it often seems that just being a celebrity is the most important thing. Thank you so much, Amanda Foreman. And on the point of celebrity, I think, you know, her grandchildren have in many ways become celebrities, um, certainly as Prince Harry and his wife, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, moved here to the United States. And I want to bring in uh, Mark Phillips on that point, because it is our understanding that Prince William, uh, His Royal Highness, and Prince Harry are there at Balmoral Castle, correct? Uh, we know Prince William is there. Uh, we had heard that Prince Harry was due to arrive five or ten minutes ago or so. I haven't seen actual uh, visual confirmation that he is there. It's significant that he did not fly up with his brother, uh, his, uh, the Queen's children, uh, Andrew and, um, and Edward and, and Sophie, her daughter-in-law, uh, flew up uh, together in one plane. Uh, there was some thought that uh, uh, that Harry might be in that plane, but it turned out he was traveling separately. Um, Meghan Markle is not uh, going, as neither is uh, Kate, uh, William's wife. They stayed back in London uh, with the kids. Um, but yes, uh, we think that uh, Harry is either there about there or thereabouts now. And Mark, just for clarification, because we were just showing pictures of Prince William and Kate and their three children walking. That was from earlier this week as they were at their new cottage. Explain how they've moved and how that family is transitioning as well. They, they're moving out of central London uh, in, onto a cottage on the estate, in the royal estate at Windsor, uh, as a way of giving the kids a more normal uh, kind of uh, upbringing. They, they've, they've eschewed a lot of the, uh, the trappings of, of royalty, footmen and butlers and servants running hot and cold and that kind of thing, and are trying to establish as much of a quiet family life as they can and they're, and they're doing that uh, on this uh, cottage on, on the Windsor uh, estate. Previous to, to that you may have known they were li living in Kensington Palace which is smack dab in the mm -hmm. middle of London and offers them no privacy at all. This is the place to hope to get some. Mm -hmm. And there we see, I believe they were taking the kids to their first day of school yeah. at their new, new school there as they're in a, what I understand is maybe a four bedroom home, which is smaller for them where they're saying the nanny is no longer a living. But now, of course, Prince William becomes the heir to the throne and likely they had perhaps anticipated that as which is why they wanted even more privacy. I want to bring in Holly Williams one more time from outside Buckingham Palace. And um, Holly, I understand that more and more people are coming to, um, to be with one another there and, and mark the passing of Her Majesty. That's right, Nora. In fact, we've just heard that, that Charles, who is now the king, will be known as King Charles III. There was some speculation that he might be known by some other name. I think, as you can see behind me, we've now got thousands of people coming down into central London to the gates of Buckingham Palace. Um, you know, uh, it's not 
an unexpected death. She, she was elderly. She was she was in ill health. Um, but I think it's still shocking for people because she was such a fixture uh, in this country, had been on the throne for decades. Um, I can speak a bit to that personally. I'm not British. I'm Australian. I'm from a former British colony, now, now a member of the Commonwealth. She was a fixture of our country as well, even though she was tw a 24 hour flight away or, you know, several months sail away when, when our country was first uh, colonised by the British. She's on our money, just as she's on the money here in the UK. And, you know, she's she was a kind of constant topic of conversation uh, in Australia when I was growing up. I, I really remember that um, when we were children, uh, if we didn't display very good habits at the, at the dinner table, my parents would say, we won't take you for tea with the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it, Holly Williams, a reminder about um, the Queen's constant presence in many people's uh, lives. And um, as we've been covering, um, Queen Elizabeth II um, died earlier today at her Balmoral Castle in Scotland and the impact of Queen Elizabeth had on not just the United Kingdom, but the world cannot be overstated. Her death will be followed by 10 days of mourning across the country and around the world. Our coverage of the death of Queen Elizabeth will continue on CBS News streaming your local news and tonight on the CBS Evening News. Thank you for joining us for this CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell, along with my colleagues here and around the world. Thank you.